I think it's possible to ask God and the angels for too much. No, absolutely not. 12 chapters of the book of Revelation, St. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. It's a battle that's depicted there. That idea I think is important for us today that we are at war for little babies. We're at war for the salvation of souls. We're at war against the forces of evil who want to steal all of these souls away into hell. God loves instrumental causality. He loves it when you ask and the angel responds and his will is accomplished. He loves it when... Father Ambrose Christ, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me back, Lila. First time here with the new set, so it's great to see you here. Yeah. And looks comfortable. Yes, feels great. Good. Good to see Our you. Our air conditioning just turned off, so hopefully it's not going to get too warm in here. But you're a favorite on the podcast. You come in and give us all of the theological and historical wisdom about church and the tradition. So I'm very excited to talk about angels with you. Great. And Michael Mess. Yes. So let's start, though, with the breaking news that we were just talking about before yes, we important. sat down together, which is this news about... President Trump and him actually backing a pro-life initiative in Florida. Thanks be to God. It wasn't looking good a couple yes, of days ago, was it? It was not looking good. And I, I know you have a lot of a lot of perspective on the role of people of faith in politics. Mm. So I actually wanted to hear about that. But just for people who are listening who might not know what just happened, okay. President Trump yesterday was saying he wasn't sure if he was going to support an amendment in the state of Florida that would legalize abortion through all nine months effectively. Mm. And he was criticizing pro-life laws in the state. So the pro-life community was very upset about this. Understandably, and, and, then, and rightly. And rightly so. And then he came out again just today, minutes ago, and he said that actually he's going to vote no on the amendment, effectively supporting the pro-life movement in the state to fight the extremism of the amendment. So this is a big move because before he was indicating that he might support the amendment. Yes. Well, thanks be to God. You know, you think, how can it ever be that a policy or a platform or support of any kind of legislation that destroys the lives of little children in their mother's womb, how can, you, how can we possibly think that that would ever be politically expedient or good? So obviously this man has been uh, the object of divine intervention. That, that is to say that he was miraculously saved from, from assassination. You think it Every was a miracle? You just you look at the videos of that, right? And the the fact that he turned his head like that mm. is a it's it has to. He said himself that he thinks it's an act of God. Okay, well, we better just keep praying that God keeps intervening in his life and in the life of everybody else who's standing mm. for office in this pivotal election year, right? So the fact that we have this flip flopping policy, flip flop flopping regarding the sanctity of human life means that people of faith need to keep praying hard, keep praying hard that hearts will change. If a few days ago it looked like his support of that was going to go the wrong way, mm -hmm. and two days later, as you said, just breaking, no. Okay, so that means that someone's praying, I would guess, and the angels are intervening, <laughs> you know, tapping on the shoulder mm -hmm. of whether it's Trump himself or his handlers or his advisors or... The, uh, the campaign team. So we have to just keep praying hard that, that politics is not about what's expedient, but actually what's true. Yes. When did we, when did we ever think politics is just about what's exp expedient? Politics is about the common good. Mm -hmm. That's fundamentally what we're about in politics mm -hmm. is preserving, maintaining, uplifting, upholding, and advancing the common good of, of a citizenry. So so I, I, I just think that our prayers must work. They have to work. Our Lord promised that they would. I love that. I love that, that, that call to prayer. And we're going to talk about the spiritual aspect of this, like you are mentioning. I also think it's the power of speaking out and yes. expressing our up, uh, outrage. I mean, it is outrage that, you know, if a candidate campaigns on life in the past and, you know, has the pro-life vote in the past and indicates that's their stance, not perfectly, but you know, as a, as a large thrust of their campaign, mm. and then they change it mid-campaign, which is what so many pro-lifers are upset about with right. what President Trump's recent statements have been. He came out in support of the abortion pill, which is 60% of abortions. Terrible. Said he would veto abortion bans. You know, starting to use the reproductive rights language, like I'm for reproductive rights. And Terrible. then, you know, this indication that he might not support the pro-life effort in Florida, I think was hugely concerning. Mm. And I think a lot of pro-lifers in the last week raised their voices. Now there's a question though, Father Ambrose, about some 
people say, well, if you criticize a candidate that mm. is better than the other guy, mm -hmm. you know, we know Kamala Harris and uh, Tim Walls, that ticket is so pro-abortion, but there's, I think, a narrative that says, well, if you criticize your candidate, then you're gonna suppress the vote about that mm -hmm. candidate. Mm -hmm. And then the other camp says, actually, it's the job of the voters before the election, you know, the election's in two months, so we're filming this over two months out, to urge the candidates to stand strong to win the vote. What's your right. take on that? Well, you know, our government is a representational government mm -hmm. and we elect people to represent us. That's the whole point. Yes. So it's important for us to make our opinions and our preferences known to the candidates whom we are potentially going to be voting for. So you, you said there, you know, there's a role of activism. You very much stand in the, on the side of radical, courageous, heroic activism for human life. So absolutely right now, you and everybody in the pro-life movement who is vocal and and more than just concerned, but actually active in the movement need to speak out. Absolutely. And otherwise, we're, otherwise we have a, a, the possibility of just standing mm -hmm. back and watching the political climate degenerate even further leading up to the election because we're afraid of what might be the, the uh, result of that yeah. for, for criticizing the, the better of the two, right. the lesser of the two evils. So activists have a place in political discourse and especially the, leading up to an election like this one that's, that's coming so quickly. And the, the ordinary voter, if, if we can say such a person exists, I mean, mm -hmm. everybody has a voice in our government right. or at especially least- Especially in the social media era and with your neighbors right. and your that's family. Right. At least we're supposed yeah. to. Now, whether or not that's actually the way politics works right now is not so obvious, but nevertheless, we are citizens of a republic and we can speak our hearts in the republic in which we live with, as you said, with maybe on social media, with our family, with our friends. We need to move hearts. How are we gonna do that if we don't speak up? Yes, exactly. Well, I think it's definitely shows the power of being willing to speak even if it's unpopular, because I do think there is this narrative that if you criticize the candidate, then you are mm. going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And of course you might hurt them, but mm. you also might help them. That's right. Or they might- And it's a uh, risk. It's a risk. Yeah. They might hear, um, they or their handlers or their uh, campaign managers might hear, wow, this actually is the wrong direction. We're going in the yes. wrong direction. Let's, it's a warning. Let, it's a warning. Yeah. And let's yeah. turn, let's take a, like, let's take a turn toward what's true and, and good and beautiful instead of going down this path of expediency for the sake of being elected. Now we can, criticize and also say, you know, criticism can be uh, mature. Mm -hmm. We can criticize a candidate. We can criticize a policy and say, I'm still supporting this person, even though I'm critical of what they just said about this or that, you know, that right. just, just voicing a criticism doesn't mean that we're bailing on the whole project. But sometimes to get your message heard, you sometimes there might have to be a bit of a, an edge there. Like yes, if you absolutely. keep doing this, I might have to bail. Yes, well, and that's, and, where, and that's, that's where, where people that's, like you fit in, yeah. right? <laughs> and your organization, right. that's right. Yeah. Because you have a big platform mm -hmm. and that way your, your voice has teeth in a way that someone who's just speaking with their family or their friends mm. might not. Yeah, but I, I think every voter of course has power in in what they say, how they think about this, and and how they talk about it with their friends too, and you know that's that's why it's encouraging that President Trump has done this because now it's not like an endless race to the bottom between the right. Democrats and the Republicans, which is where it seemed to be heading on the abortion right. issue, which is right. the most important human rights issue of the day. Absolutely right, and the church has always told us that, and it's it's the it's where we have to focus our attention right now, and also focus our prayers, mm -hmm. direct our prayers. So let's talk about prayer okay. next and the angels yes. because they have an important role to play. Someone yes. might make the case that it was Trump's guardian angel that helped protect him from the bullet that almost took his life. He has a guardian angel, just like you do and I do. Mm -hmm. Every human being has a guardian angel. So what's the scriptural backing for guardian angels? Okay. And then I want to hear what are archangels? Okay. Because Great. we're going to talk specifically a lot about St. Michael. St. Michael, who's an archangel. He's okay, the patron so of your abbey. Yes. So the um, principal New Testament uh, scriptural citation for the existence of guardian angels comes from the mouth of our Lord himself, mm -hmm. Matthew 18. He says, do not despise these little one, one of these little ones, referring to the little mm -hmm. children, do not despise one of these little ones, for they have 
and for their angels always look upon the face of my father who is in heaven. So every little child and by extension, every human being has an angel who is somehow belongs to that person and who is always looking upon the face of God in heaven, God the Father in heaven. That's the principal New Testament citation where we can look to the existence of guardian angels. But the angels are all over the scriptures from beginning to end, from the first book to the last. You know, <laughs> you, you can hardly turn a page of the scriptures without coming across angels in, um, in Genesis, in Daniel, in Isaiah, in Tobit, everywhere, the book mm -hmm. of the Apocalypse, Revelation at the end. So the scriptures are just covered with these wonderful creatures, the angels, and some, some um, little places like, not a little place, but from, from our Lord himself, like that in, in the 18th chapter of St. Matthew, we know a lot more about them than people might think. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately like Pampers, are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with everylife. Everylife.com is not only a best in class product for babies, but it also loves babies babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to everylife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. So what are angels made of? Great. What, what do they, what do they look like? Okay. And yeah, tell me more about their, I guess it would be their ontology, the okay, ontology yeah, of an what angel. Are, what are they? What are That's, they? Yeah, what, are, what is their being? St. Gregory and St. Augustine uh, both say that the name angel, Angelus, talks about what they do, what is their mission, not who they are. Angelus means messenger. Hmm. That's the Latin word. It's a Greek word that the, that the Latin language also picks up, Angelus, Angelos, Angelus. So they are messengers. They are the intermediaries between God and mankind. They bring important messages to earth. Uh, they also are involved, we learn from the fathers of the church, reflecting on the Holy Scriptures, that they're also involved in the creation of the universe. They are in the hierarchy of being between God himself and the Holy Trinity and the created material order. The angels stand in between those two. They are created beings but they are not material. So you said, what are they? What is their ontology? What is their being? They are pure spirits, pure created spirits, and they have a rational nature like humans do, meaning that they have a intellect and a free will. An intellect and a will is what makes them rational like humans are rational. So can they pick and choose what body to put on in order with, if yeah. God gives them the, I don't know, the, the power to do it? I mean, do they all have the power to embody themselves mm. in order to do certain errands for God or if they're a demonic spirit to do an errand for the evil one? They only do God's will. They, they perfectly do God's will. The holy angels, uh, this kind of goes back to a previous conversation we've had about fallen angels and holy good mm -hmm. angels, the... the uh, the, the holy angels, we call them. The holy angels are perfectly aligned to the will of God from the moment of their creation after they chose in that one perfect act of their will, um, a little bit of a tangent, because they have no bodies, because they're pure spirits, they're perfect intellects and perfect wills. That is, they know everything they're supposed to know uh, when they look upon the face of God. And they have a perfect will in that they make one choice for God or against God, and everything else follows after that. It's a perfect act of their, of their rational will. 
I'm a, that must be so nice, by the way. I know, right? Why can't we? Why can't I mean? Perfectly I aligned. We're gonna have it in heaven. Lyra. We're gonna have it in heaven. Please I know. God. But every day we're making a million choices, and half of them are bad. It's like because we don't see, we don't see or know with that kind of clarity mm -hmm. because we are composite beings with with bodies along with our mm -hmm. immortal souls. So so we don't have that same kind of perfection in the way that our intellects and our wills work. Um, so can they choose to put on a body that they, they just have like the book of Tobit, by the way, right. which is so everyone loves the book of Tobit, and yes, but the, the Archangel Raphael, yeah, there. the wonderful Archangel Raphael to come and be a matchmaker. Yes. It's for so the beautiful. Love lost That's right. Folks in Tobit. And, and they, my understanding is Raphael presented himself as a relative Yes, in order to matchmake a couple. And yes. he went undercover as yes. a human being and he lied. I mean, again, I don't know if you would agree that it was, it's technically a lie, but he represented himself as someone he was not and in the, order to meet, get two people to meet and fall in love. Yes. So when the angels show up here on earth, as it were, um, at the Annunciation of our Lord's Incarnation to the Blessed Virgin Mary or Zechariah in the temple, the Annunciation of the Conception of St. John the Baptist, um, whenever angels show up, people see them. And presumably that's not just somehow a trick of the mind that, that the angels mm -hmm. affect, but it's also a reality in, in, their, in a physical body, which they can take up, they can assume. And it's because the angelic world has this access to the material world. Mm. All, already from the beginning of the universe, uh, the fathers tell us uh, that in the creation of the universe, God who works through these, these hierarchical and instrumental means, he used the angels to whip up the matter of the created material universe. So that's a why, cool idea. So why couldn't they uh, take up the material that that looks like a human body and inhabit it for a while, so as to appear to us? You know. So what, you're saying that. So the you're saying that the early church fathers they theorize. Are they speaking with full confidence that God used the angels as instruments to create the world as we know it? Yes, so they theorized, and that goes along with the understanding of cosmology, how the yeah. world works, how philosophy works, what it, what natural philosophy is. Um, they understood that, that there is this wonderful hierarchy of being from, as I said, God himself at the very pinnacle of it, God who is immaterial, immortal, uh, without without um, anything outside of him. And when he acted outside of himself to create the visible order of the material world, the universe in which we live, and to create us, he also created the angels. So the Fourth Lateran Council, which is the beginning of the 1200s, said that defined, um, of course, this, this is much later than the early church mm -hmm. fathers, but the reflection of the church upon scriptural truths and the realities that, of Christian doctrine continues to unfold through time. So the Fourth Lateran Council said that God created the angels, and also there's a part of that council that says that he created the angels before he created mankind. Mm. So, so there's an order to the way that God created things, and the angels helped with that ordering and with that creation. So again, that's all theoretical, but not, not purely speculative. Yes. It's not just someone's sort of imaginative idea. It's based in the truths that we know from philosophy and theology. So in this room right now, presumably there's at least three angels. Yes, which is a crazy. Maybe trick. four, because the some of the some of the wonderful fathers of the church say that a priest gets another one at oh, his ordination. Of course, sorry, Father. I, 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 cut, I hope cut that's you true. short. I could, I could use a few more than that. Um, that's wonderful. So, and and have you had an experience with your angels? Gosh, that's a great question. I think I have an experience of my angel every day, many mm -hmm. times a day. Maybe not, I don't see my angel. I've never seen my angel. But, you know, whenever we pray, our angels are praying with us. They're taking our prayers and presenting them before the throne of, of God. Whenever the sacraments are administered in the church, whenever Holy Mass is offered or a confession is heard or a little baby is baptized, the angels crowd around that sacramental moment with wonder and adoration at the fact that Christ's sacred humanity is so present on earth. Mm. Um, I've had many experiences in my life, uh, I'll narrow that down to my priestly life, where I find myself saying something, especially in the confessional or preaching from the pulpit, and 
I don't know why I'm saying or where those words are coming from. Wow. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that that's because my angel is helping me. Mm. It, helping you help a soul. I think so. And of mm. course, that's God's work. That's the Holy Spirit who speaks in our hearts, right? We know that, that the, the Holy Spirit prays within us with groanings, mm. you know, with inexpressible groanings. The angels mediate that too. So I think it, God, the Holy Spirit, who speaks through our hearts and sp speaks through the mouth of a priest, hopefully in, in those moments, those important moments of pastoral ministry, and the angels are helping to mediate that too. So I know the words to say. I've had this experience before with, and, and you, I think maybe it's an experience when people are doing vocational work mm. that they feel they're called to do, mm. where there's a, a, whether it's words that you're given or just a sense of a supernatural assistance. Mm. And, you know, you could say, well, that's, that's God or that's the Holy Spirit. How, how do you know? I mean, obviously if it's your angel, that's the Holy Spirit using your angel. Same, same. Yes, exactly. Same, same. Same, same. Yeah, the the they are instruments of God. They are instruments of God. If they, if but they what, what, when would it be that was the Holy Spirit versus that was my angel, or are they they're together working together? I on think it? they're working together because you know, like I said, God loves to use instrumental. He used to, loves to use instruments mm -hmm. in working out His holy will among us. Um, if that's even from whipping up creation at its origin, the beginning of creation of the material universe, He did that through the ministry of angels. He announced the most important moments of salvation history through the ministry of angels. Why wouldn't he be speaking to your heart through the ministry of an angel too? Mm. Uh, they are the intermediaries. Well, they are and the I, messengers. I think even of just uh, the gospels and, you know, God used angels to announce to Mary that she would bring Jesus into the world. And yes, a specific used, one, the Archangel Gabriel. Yes, and then he used, obviously, an angel for St. Joseph. And yes. I think, why wouldn't he just go himself, you know, through the Holy Spirit? Because he likes to use, like you said, instruments. Yes. I have so many more questions on angels. So I want to talk about UFOs, actually, because <laughs> okay. I, I'm curious your theory on that. But but before we go to UFOs, you mentioned the other archangel, yes. another archangel, St. Gabriel. Yes. What is the difference between archangels and okay. your everyday angel. Okay, so um, we have these hierarchies of angels, language about, is it an angel, is it an archangel? St. Paul speaks about mm -hmm. powers and dominions and thrones. We have these names for these creatures or powers outside of, uh, outside of mankind, and they're scriptural names. And we need some help from the great theologians and doctors of the church, fathers of the church, to help us to sort that out you know, scripture is often impenetrable. It's penetrable because the Holy Spirit helps mm -hmm. us to understand the scriptures. But the great Christian thinkers from all of our tradition help us to tease out some of these nuances. We have these um, wonderful reflections from, uh, I'm going to cite a few of them, okay. the, great, the great theologians who tell us about the hierarchies mm -hmm. of angels. Most principally, Dennis the Areopagite, Dionysius mm -hmm. the Areopagite, who was a 6th century Syrian monk, wrote in Greek, and took the name Dennis, Dionysius, so mm -hmm. because he wanted to take up, he wanted to be like the Dionysius that St. Paul met at the Areopagus mm -hmm. in, in Athens. And so the tradition of Greek philosophy in the Near East and in the Christian world of the Near East, he wrote a magnificent treatise called The Celestial Hierarchies, where he lays out these nine choirs of angels. That then is taken up gets its way back into the Latin West. And St. Thomas Aquinas is the, he's called the angelic doctor. He wrote uh, in his masterpiece of theology, the Summa Theologiae, in the first part of that, a whole treatise on the angels, resting his theology on the scriptures, of course, and the fathers of the church, including um, Greek and Latin fathers, and this Dionysius the Areopagite, pseudo-Dionysius we call him. So that's a long way of saying, we reflect on the scriptures through the tradition of, of Christian theology, Catholic theology, and we can speak about, we can speak quite specifically about angels, archangels, thrones, dominions. We have cherubim and seraphim. Those are all over the scriptures, right? Powers, thrones, dominions, virtues. So, so are these, and I'm looking at the verse here, uh, for by him, all things were created, like you were just sharing. This is from Colossians. Mm -hmm. So St. Paul, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Yes. And this idea of thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, yes. 
These are not talking about established uh, human powers Correct. that we elect or we appoint. Correct. You're talking about, the, here St. Paul's talking about angels. That's what the fathers of the church so, tell us so in reflecting on the are scriptures. Are there different statuses of angels then? Like if they you're a throne angel yes. versus a dominion yes, angel? Yes, they are hierarchical. So, and and the uh, the theologians, the, again, this is what we call speculative theology. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that angels e exist is an article of our faith. We, we must believe that angels exist. And how could you not if you pick up the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. But all of these details, these niceties about their hier hierarchical arrangement, what they do, where they sit in that hierarchy, that's all speculative theology, which means it's not not true, but it's not an object of faith that you must believe it like this. So the cherubim and the seraphim, these are the top brass angels, They're right? They're right by the throne of God. <laughs> okay. They, the seraphim are the fiery ones burning with love for God. And they're just worshiping. They're just worshiping. They're not anyone's guardian angel. They're just worshipers. We don't think that they are. Okay. And then underneath those guys, you've got what? The cherubim. Okay. That's and they're, oh, the, so the seraphim and then the cherubim. Yes. And and so the, they're- Are they cute little fat no, blonde babies? No, they don't have like bodies. It, like, no. like a, I mean, that's how they're depicted, right, in yes. a lot of- Art. Exactly. If you read the the language of the scriptures about the angels, they're not cute little. They're kind of terrifying. They're terrifying. Like, <laughs> you know, a wheel covered with eyes all around, and there are swords, and there are wings, and they're they're powerful, powerful creatures. Every angel, because it doesn't have a body, is its own species. So you and I are are instantiations, individuals of the same species, the human species. Each angel is its own species, as different wow. one from another, as an elephant from an ant, or you might say as a plant, one planet from another. Uh, they're, they're radically different. Each is its own individual species. So the cherubs that are depicted in a lot of classical art, you know what yes. I'm just yes. referring to? They're like these little cute fat babies, basically. Mm -hmm. They do not look terrifying. They look cute. No. What do you think the artist is trying to depict there? What's the tradition there? I think trying to encourage us with the consoling idea that these creatures are mm -hmm. here to help us and to love us and to help us to love God better and to bring us to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, So that they're they cherubs, not cherubim. <laughs> A cherub is, that's the singular, cherubim yes. is the plural. But but they are trying to depict the cherubim, but they're making them look like, when yes. we say like cherub, a, it's exactly. like, like a, a little, fat baby. Uh, exactly. But you're saying they're not, they don't look like that. They're probably terrifying to behold. That's the artistic license of, okay. of, of the tradition of Western Christian art, I see. which wants to, it's doing all kinds of things to remind us that angels are here and with I us see. around the altar, you know, around a Baroque altar, a Rococo altar. It's just covered in these wonderful, adorable little cherubs. The bottom of the pecking order are the angels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th that's the place that, that they are closest to, um, to what's going on here on earth. And that's where the guardian angels come from. The theologians tell us they come from the bottom rank of the angels. The archangels are the choir just above the angels. Okay. So St. Michael is an archangel, St. Raphael, St. Gabriel. Now the Eastern tradition, St. Basil the Great says that St. Michael, the archangel, is actually, we call him the archangel because he's the prince of the whole heavenly court. He's the prince of all of the angels from the highest seraph all the way down. That's what we call him archangel, kind of the top angel. That's what we mean by that. In the Latin tradition from St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, we, we speculate that it could be that St. Michael and St. Gabriel, St. Raphael are at the top of the archangel's choir further down the pecking order. Covenant Eyes helps men and women achieve victory over porn addiction by blocking explicit websites and helping you connect with your accountability partner. This is such a beautiful approach to ensuring that people can have victory over porn addiction. Covenant Eyes has a special program called Arise, which is a 21-day video series specifically designed to help Christian women overcome sexual addiction. Arise helps you identify the wounds at the root of sexual addiction. This is a safe and confidential community for support. You can get 30 days of Covenant Eyes for free by going to the link in the description and using the code Lila at checkout. How many archangels do we think there are? Do we know? Okay, Any so sense? we only have three named in the scriptures, uh, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel. There's an apocryphal book from, of the Jewish scriptures mm -hmm. called the Book of Enoch that names seven. Mm -hmm. That wasn't, that's not a canonical book, and it wasn't canonical for the Jews of the Old Covenant either. So St. Michael's Abbey, you have a patron of St. Michael yes. as, your, as your angel. My understanding is, though, there's angels that are patrons of cities, 
of countries and perhaps even institutions. Mm -hmm. Are those archangels then? And do, is there anything we can learn or know about them? Okay, so you're asking questions that are very hard for us to penetrate, Lila. You know, well, that's why you're here, Father we're, Ambrose, because you are a, the guy. We're digging into a world that is is very much the world of speculative theology. So I can give you speculative answers, which we don't. These are not these are not articles of our faith exactly. So um, we'll take Saint Michael for the for for this example, since we love Saint Michael at Saint Michael's Abbey. We're named for the archangel Michael, the the prince of the heavenly host, the the one who is in the book of Daniel and in the book of the Apocalypse or Revelation. He's also in the letter, the Catholic Epistle of Jude, Saint Jude. Four times he, his name shows up in the scriptures. He's our holy patron. Is he guarding our monastery? I think so. We're named. Our abbey is named for him. Why couldn't he be guarding our monastery, even though he's the prince of the whole heavenly host? Those, I think he is. Your monastery is pretty doing. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And he so. protects us from all kinds of things that I'm sure we don't even know about. Right? Uh, we're we're visible. We're um, well known, and so I'm sure there's a lot of forces of evil striving to undo the good things that God is doing at our monastery, at our abbey. So I, we need his help. How does he help us? Okay, well, if that hierarchical arrangement of angels that we talked about a little while ago is true, there could be a guardian angel who is executing the marching orders of St. Michael the Archangel. And pseudo Dionysius, that is Dennis the Areopagite, that, that ninth century, sixth century Syrian monk, would say that it might be something like there's a whole chain through all nine choirs of angels that is Michael. Michael the Archangel through Michael the Power. They're like throne. his his regiment. It's his column of his column of angels. And we just call that Michael because how can we call these creatures anything? It's like we, the Navy SEALs. Something like that. I so, love that. <laughs> so I think that um, we it's probably better for us to say that whether it's a country or a city or an institution or maybe a family or a church has an angel, that's something like a guardian angel. Where that angel comes from from that hierarchy, that's up to God. You know, he sends an archangel to speak to our lady at the Annunciation. He sends another archangel, Michael, to protect um, the body of Moses. We learned that in the epistle of St. Jude, amazing. He sends uh, Raphael to work on that matchmaking that we talked about in the book of Tobit. So where the angels come from in the hierarchy and how God sends them, a great mystery. Now, the book of... Jude, you mentioned, yes, and Tobit. the letter, the epistle of St. Jude. The letter of Jude. Yes. Uh, this is not considered scripture to me, by many Protestants. Right. So we're it's talking a Catholic about, epistle. This right. is a Catholic epistle. Yeah, one of the ones, so there there are some books of the both the Old Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament that the Protestant reformers took out of the canon. And I want to address that briefly because we've got a lot of evangelicals and Protestants okay. who listen to the show. And so... Uh, what's your take on why the Protestants chose to remove the Reformers? Again, yes. not your average Protestant is like anti those books necessarily. They right. might not even know about those books. Like when I was growing up evangelical and I got my first Bible, you know, it, it didn't have those books in it. So I, I didn't know any better. Uh, right. So what would be your take on why that happened and why these books are actually meant to be in the Bible? Okay. I'll give you the I'll give you the dyed in the wool Roman Catholic answer to that because we shouldn't be ashamed of these things. I think some of those books were removed by the Protestant reformers because they contained doctrine that was not very convenient for the Reformation, like prayer for the dead in the the book the books of Maccabees, or like uh, the uh, the wonderful revelations of the heavenly liturgy in the book of Revelation, or the this language. For example, in the Epistle of Saint Jude, um, about about the body of Moses and the presence of Saint Michael, or like in the Epistle of Saint James, about the combination of prayer and work, mm -hmm. um, that the necessary for work to demonstrate how our faith is um, active and and filled with love and moving in the right direction. So. So I think that some of the, there's also uh, there was also some question about especially the Old Testament books like I, I cited Maccabees they we have them in Greek but we don't have them in Hebrew they they only existed in Greek so there was some question about whether or not they were actual actually part of the the Old Testament 
But the Catholic Church, which is the the church established by Jesus, mm -hmm. established by Jesus Christ, and which is the place where we know which books are scriptural, you know, why do we not read the book of Enoch or the Gospel of St. Thomas? Because the church and her tradition told us that those are not inspired books. So if we have to wait till the, you know, 1500 years later for someone else to say, well, actually, we're we're also going to take out these books because we don't like what they contain outside of the tradition of the church which Christ established. That's a bit of a problem, I think. It's so, a it's a pretty dramatic precedent that they set. Right. I mean, fortunately, I, I do think there's a lot of respect among a lot of um, evangelicals today, you know, mm -hmm. very sincere hearted that they want to really be Bible based. Mm -hmm. So there's right. not like another wave to like, well, let's take out more books that we don't like. Right. You know, that that's not really the the move, although there's tremendous debate about what does it mean, all of the different yes. verses in the Bible. Yes. That, there you know, again, you, why a magisterium is so important. Right. The magisterium is the teaching authority of the church, which right. Christ established, because... To help interpret the sacred Sometimes scripture. it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand what does this scripture mean. All right. So I want to get back to Michael Mass and St. Michael's Abbey, okay. because that's coming up soon. And then yes. I want to talk more about stories of angels, because I think they're very inspiring. Yes. Um, but you're celebrating something really special because you are St. Michael's Abbey. Yes. What are you celebrating soon? What is its history in the church? Okay. And what should people know? At the end of September, September 29th, is the feast, the Solemnity of St. Michael and all the, are the, all the archangels. This is a feast that goes way back many, many centuries ago. Uh, the celebration of St. Michael on September 29th is connected with a particular basilica outside mm -hmm. of the city of Rome that was consecrated in honor of St. Michael. I think it was in the 7th century, although I might be mistaken about that. So this celebration on that date at the end of September goes way back. To the 7th century. Yes. It's wow. a, a, based on a certain church building. And and there are many, there are many feasts through the year of St. Michael, depending on where you look and depending on where he's appeared according to the tradition of the church. So St. Michael has appeared. Yes, he has appeared where we, we learn from, the, we can talk about that maybe, okay. that's a fun tangent, as a really fun I'll tangent. I'll let you do the tangent on uh, as okay. you as you please then. Okay, <laughs> then um, the uh, Michaelmas, which is like Christmas, the mass in honor of the birth of Christ. Michaelmas is the mass in honor of St. Michael, is the, what we call this feast. And it's really important at our abbey because he's our patron and because we, we built the church in a special way so that there's a ray of light that comes through the, the rose window in the west and on the Feast of St. Michael at Vespers during uh, the singing of Our Lady's Magnificat, the light ray shines on the altar, the high altar in the sanctuary. We, we did that deliberately. The architect made it to do that. The church is built so that the feast day has this wonderful kind of... Based on where the sun is in the sky. Exactly. Where the sun is setting in the sky. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's very we used, cool. We used to build churches like that all the time. What if it's overcast? Well, then it doesn't come through the okay. window. Okay. Has that happened? <laughs> it has happened. Okay. Although, although... But mostly not, right? <laughs> mostly not. Yes. It's Southern California. So, yeah. You know. It's a great place for it. So so, so that light shine... And tell, tell us exactly what the light does. It, on it Michael comes Mast. through the rose window, through the stained glass mm -hmm. window, and it illumines the, the beautiful white marble altar in the sanctuary and just glows like it's glowing from within. It's Amazing. super cool. And then, of course, we fill the sanctuary with incense while we're praying, and it's just the spectacular liturgical celebration with a choir of canon singing, the church is packed with people, because the Feast of St. Michael has always been an important celebration uh, for, for Christians around the world. In fact, it even used to have a fasting season, hmm. uh, St. Michael's Fast, which began, um, which traditionally begins on Our Lady's Assumption, August 15th, and extends until Michaelmas, September 29th. Do you, do you uh, practice so the fast? It's not, it's not an observed fast in the Western church anymore, although we're going to do that really in a concerted way this year. We're, we have a special novena at the Abbey precisely because it's such a pivotal year in our country. Um, it's a pivotal year. Just we need St. Michael's help. The world seems to be teetering. And, you know, St. Michael is the champion of God's people, he was the champion of God's people in the Old Covenant. He's the champion of God's people in the New Covenant. We need his powerful intercession. So we're, we, we have called a special novena at the Abbey with, with some spiritual talks given, special prayers said, processions um, around the Abbey Church, culminating in the feast um, on September 29th. So people should follow that online because all of that is available online. We'll and we'll link it that. in the description. Yeah, please. That's our Abbot Circle. Mm -hmm. um, 
platform and all of our social media platforms will have a lot of information about that. But I, we're emphasizing it this year because we need the assistance of the Holy Angels. They're so important uh, for all the reasons we've talked mm-hmm. about and for all the reasons we might not know to, to save us, mm-hmm. to help us to come to know Jesus Christ better, right? To conform our lives to his, to desire what he desires, that is the salvation of every man and woman. WeHeartNutrition.com is a wholesome product with wholesome values. This is a vitamin company which designs its product with the highest quality ingredients that are research-backed specifically for wherever you are at in your life. So if you are a woman just seeking an everyday vitamin, WeHeartNutrition.com has got the best product for you. If you are seeking to conceive, you're hoping to get pregnant, they've got a product for you. If you are pregnant, they've got a product that's a great prenatal vitamin for you. If you've just had a baby and you need to replenish all of those depleted vitamins in your body and minerals in your body, they've got the best product for you. We Heart Nutrition has got you covered wherever you are in your stage in life. And what's awesome about this company is it's not only an American-based company and a small family business, but they support your values. WeHeartNutrition.com actually donates a full 10% of its sales back to the pro-life movement, supporting moms and babies in need. So stop buying your vitamins from some big conglomerate that doesn't support your values and order these amazing vitamins to help you thrive. That's WeHeartNutrition.com, and you can use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your first order. That's WeHeartNutrition.com, and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. Um, okay, so back to the tangent where St. Michael appeared. There's this marvelous uh, line of monasteries called St. Michael's Sword, the Sword of St. Michael, because it's uh, like a straight line. Seven monasteries, ancient monasteries, starting off the coast of Ireland— continuing to a, a monastery off the course of, Con- of Cornwall in England, then Mont Saint-Michel in France, famous monastery in Normandy off the coast. Then the next one is in the north of Italy. Wow. Piedmont. The same then order? It's all in a line on the map. Wow. A Intentionally, mon- of course. Or no. Intentionally by God's design. Hmm. Another monastery in at the south of Italy, in Puglia, Monte Sant'Angelo, where St. Michael appeared and consecrated the Basilica himself, one in Greece, and then the last one on Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Seven places, some of which had an apparition of St. Michael, some of which were also pagan sites of worship before Christianity was preached there. And they all line up at, I think, the solstice, the summer solstice, a similar kind of light thing happens to line these monasteries up on the map. Crazy. You think you think that 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 is just coincidence? I don't. Well, I don't either. Although some people listening might think, well, that sounds kind of like superstition. It well, l- listen, these are places where people are worshiping God and monasteries are built in God's praise and souls are saved, the sacraments are celebrated, whether they line up or not. They're still great right. places. Right, the truth is still the truth. The truth is still the truth. And the fact that someone then looks at a map, once we can know where these are on a map, and say, wow, that's a straight line. <laughs> and actually, there's this light spectacle that happens lining them all up on this important day of the year. I think that's, I don't think that's just superstitious mm. at all. I think that's noticing what God is doing. Mm. The handiwork of God. His providence might look like superstition, but in fact, it's God's providence. Well, and it's also not an article of faith. It's not like, oh, you have to think it's a sword of St. Michael and it's intentional. Right. But if it strengthens your faith. Yes. And God does this. I mean, he does this in our personal lives. He sends us little encouragements or maybe something that meant a lot to us, an image that we might have seen or a conversation that we had to strengthen our faith. And that's not us being superstitious. That's us listening, trying to listen for the voice of That's the Lord. That's just being grateful. Mm. Being grateful that God is actually present in my life mm. and he wants me to know that he's present in my life, right? How is that, that superstitious? I love that. We want to just be like boring materialists <laughs> who want to see everything in terms of, right. of... Proof, give me proof. Sad. Well, I think this is... I wanted to talk more about just experience with the angel because you were sharing about your experience with your guardian angel. Mm. And I've heard different stories over the years of people who really felt like their angel was looking out for them in a specific way. Have you heard any of those stories? Oh my goodness, so many. Well, I hear them all the time. People share wonderful stories with me. I'll, I'll share one with you from um, one of the confers who lives in my abbey. I won't name it, but all my confers, if they watch this, will know who I'm talking about. He was driving, he had been driving back and forth between our abbey and the convent of cloistered 
Norbertine Canoneses, which is three hours from our abbey. He had been driving back and forth a lot for work he was doing there many years ago. Driving back from the convent back to the abbey in the middle of the night, exhausted, he fell asleep on the freeway. He, so he woke up from a dead sleep in a car that was running, parked at the bottom of an off-ramp with, at an intersection. And he's, there's no explanation for how he got there unless there was some kind of intervention. Wow. So again, is that demonstrable? No, but it seems obvious to me that God sent an angel, maybe his guardian angel to help save him from certain death on a California freeway. Wow. So that's just one little example. There are so many. I love that. I had a friend who shared one time they were driving and they felt an audible voice. They thought they were heard an audible voice. It was like, move over or, you know, move left or something, you know, get out of the lane that they were in. And they moved just in time that a, I guess a semi truck or something was veering off and they would have been crashed into yes. and maybe killed. But they, they were confident this was their angel. Because they actually heard something yes. audible or they, interiorly. To get their some, attention. It, it was wow. loud enough to get their attention. That's awesome. And to listen to what that voice was. Praise God. Um, do you think that the angels, what, what are they doing right now with the country the way that it is mm. and mm. hearts and minds the way that they are? There's so much division and confusion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to pray for conversion and pray for mercy. I've been doing these YouTube lives and I end with a decade of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Great. People pray that. Great. But- how should we ask the angels or involve the angels in this? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. What does question. that look like? The, the angels are always worshiping God. Our Lord says that those angels are always looking upon the face of my heavenly Father who is in heaven. Their, their principal job or task is to adore God before the throne of grace. They worship God. And at the same time, if their mission is to help us, they're assisting us to get there too. So your guardian angel, my guardian angel, all of the angels want us to know the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and to come to the font of baptism. They want us to be saved. And then they want us to, so that's their principal object for every soul. Every human being born for all of time has an angel assigned to it who is trying to get it to hear the gospel of salvation and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Trinity, to be saved and then to stay in the state of grace. So they're protecting us from diabolical incursions. They're protecting us from physical harm. They're protecting us and helping us to stay on that path to salvation so that we can join them in the worship of God in heaven. That's what they want. In a post-Christian world, which is more and more our world, they have a lot of work to do that's difficult it's difficult for the human people, for the human creatures, and it's difficult for the angelic creatures because how is it that the gospel is going to be preached to people who don't think they need to know that they need to hear it, right? I think that um, the forces of the enemy, the diabolical forces, are running more and more rampant in a post-Christian world, a neo-pagan, post-modern world. We see that with abortion, which is the sacrament mm -hmm. of the diabolical. We've talked about that before. You just see that people who can say that that is a good thing obviously are far away from God and their angels are really having to work hard to put holy thoughts in their mind that are contrary to that kind of diabolical deception. Should we pray? Should we? Can, can we send our angel to go talk to another angel? Yes, we can Like, send, can we send, can I send my angel to go talk to Kamala Harris's angel? I think so. Really? Why not? You know, we, we send, we, why not? Hmm. We can, we can send, I think it's a great idea to employ the ministry of the angels for God's holy purposes. They want nothing more than that we involve them in our lives. And, and of course, all of that is according to God's holy will. Whatever he wants is what's going to happen by way of if you ask your angel to go speak words of grace and peace and holy um, protection of life to politicians, heck yeah. That's a beautiful prayer, I think. I think we should all do that. <laughs> I think we should send our angels. I think that we should use them like an army of salvation, mm -hmm. like the army of salvation that they are. They are, you know, we use this militant language, but why not? Do you think that they're to some degree waiting to be used or are they doing this whether we ask them or not? How, I, how, what is the interplay between our free will 
and the the kind of commands. I don't know that we give our angel. Obviously, we can't tell them to do anything bad, but how much authority do we have yes. over our angel, or and then how much authority do they have over us? We don't have authority over them because they're they're so far superior to us. Um, that said, you know, St. Thomas in his treatise on prayer in the Summa talks about how this question you asked about the interplay between God's will and our free will. The idea is that there might be some things that God wants to do for us or that the angels want to mediate for us because it's God's will when we ask. Mm -hmm. And that in a certain sense, they are waiting for us to ask. Because they're waiting for us to move our will towards that. Yes, exactly. That That's right. And so they're because they're, they're, they respect the freedom of our will so much. And also because God loves instrumental causality. He loves it when you ask and the angel responds and his will is accomplished. He loves it when all of those those free agents are deployed for his good pleasure and for his glory. So, um, you know, that militant language is language that's scriptural. In the 12th book of, uh, 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, St. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. It's a battle that's depicted there in that chapter of the book of Revelation. It's a battle, like a military battle. And that, that idea, I think, is important for us today that we are at war for little babies. We are at war for their lives. We're at war for the salvation of souls. We're at war against the forces of evil who want to steal all of these souls away into hell. So yes, let's, let's think of them like an army and let's deploy them in this battle. So send your guardian angel, absolutely. And in, in a more specific way, we could even say, let's say that there's a mother or father and they have to have a difficult conversation with one of their children or someone who has to have a difficult conversation with your boss at work. Send your angel ahead mm. to, to open the heart and open the mind of the person that you're going to be speaking with, to soften their will, to conform their will to God's holy will. And to ask the angel to do something, it doesn't have to be an audible prayer. No. They can read our minds, right? So They can, they, well... Not exactly. Can they, they can, hear our, can they hear our our communications to them that are in our minds or hearts? Insofar as we allow them to, yes. Insofar as we allow them to. You know, they 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 don't have access to our will, to the to that deepest place in our heart. They don't have access to that. But they have access to everything that that we share with them and even the kind of thoughts that we make manifest to them. They can see that, sure. They can hear that, hear that, figuratively speaking. I think there's a lot of power to specific prayers mm. and specific requests. Mm -hmm. And there's so much in Holy Scripture about the power of the request and whatever you ask in my name and the story yes. of the knock, knock and it will be open the, to you. exactly, or going to the judge and maybe pleading your case and the judge won't listen. It's like, it's like she kept going and finally the judge said, you're just bothering me so much. And the Lord is like, well, so much more your father in heaven wants to give you yes. these things. And I think sometimes, I think there's two extremes. Sometimes I think we ask too little. And not just for ourselves and our own hopes and dreams, but for the world. Absolutely. And the salvation of souls Absolutely. and the changing of hearts of politicians and policy and culture and all these things. So we can ask too little and we're just like, God's will, whatever, and I'll just live my life. And it's like, you've got to specifically ask and and, and and I would say plead even. Absolutely. Because that, that, that pleading and that specificity mm -hmm. is also conforming our mind and heart to God as well. Both. It's a two-way street there, right? God loves us and he wants to pour out all these good things upon us. And he wants us, he wants us to dare, he wants us to dream big. Why not? I mean, listen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who mm -hmm. love him. Well, listen, the kingdom of God is within you. We have a foretaste of that here, even in this world. So we can ask for big things of, of God. We should be we should ask for the salvation of every soul. We should ask for the, the conversion of every heart and mind. Especially and even not especially, but even politically speaking. Do you think it's possible to ask for too much? No. Absolutely not. It's not possible to ask God and the angels for too much. No. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it even entered into the What about of material man. things though? Like again, that's, a, that's again, that's, that's all according to God's good pleasure, you know? He so might, it, so he, it's, it's okay to ask, even if it's something that seems silly. If it's, no, I, I don't think if, 
the reason why we're asking is silly or if mm. or if our intention is not pure if it's selfish or if it's silly is a good word you know if we're just being um, ridiculous about it or we're just seeking pleasure yeah in the obviously that's mm -hmm. he's never going to give us something that is sinful mm -hmm. or if our intention is somehow disordered then that's obviously not going to be a prayer that's answered but I wish that people would be more audacious in what mm -hmm. they I wish I would be more audacious in what I ask of God you know sometimes I think I think gosh um, we we have this really small hearted pusillanimous small souled way of thinking about our faith. You know, if I, you know, in Catholic language, you know, well, I'm just going to do the best I can to avoid grave sin and to stay in the state of grace and to sneak into purgatory by the back door when I die. And, you know, I'll spend the rest of whatever, hundreds of thousands of years in purgatory, and then I'll go to heaven. I think that's an awful way to think about our life of faith. God has saved us and washed us in the blood of, blood of his precious, the precious blood of his son. He sent his son to die for our salvation. You know what I mean? Why wouldn't we want to desire holiness? And not just holiness, but we have only one life to live before eternity and one life that we've been given the opportunity to share the good news of our faith. Right. And so wouldn't we want to just go whole hog on that? Yes, so that we can yes. say with Our Lady, my soul proclaims the, the greatness, great, the of, greatness the of the Lord. The greatness of the Lord. And right? also just to help other souls get to heaven with us. That's right. We don't want to go We don't want to go there by ourselves. We want to bring every soul with us. There's a... There's a tomb of a cardinal that I like very much in the in the grottos of the Basilica of St. Peter in, in Rome, in the Vatican City State. Down underneath the church where a lot of popes are buried and other important figures, Cardinal Mary Del Valle, he was the Secretary of State for Pius XII. Is that right? I'm sorry, for St. Pius X. And his tomb is there. On his tomb is his motto. It says, Da mihi animas, give me souls. That was his motto uh, for his, as a bishop, give me souls, that his whole mission, I mean, that's just one of, you know, you pick any, mm -hmm. any holy person in the history of, of Christianity, their desire is that Jesus Christ is glorified, that he's known mm -hmm. and glorified and that souls are saved. I also, though, think about, you know, the St. Irenaeus, the glory of God is man fully alive. Yes. And this idea of our talents. Yes. that God gave us. You know, we're not the angels like you. We're careful to make the distinction. They're superior to us in their intellect and their perfect wills. But in our flesh, we have been given, and in our intellect, we've been given these talents. Yes. And there's the parable of the talents, which has always moved me mm. very deeply whenever I contemplate that parable and how the Lord wants us to invest our talents yes. and how upset he is at the unworthy servant that like hides the talent and yes. doesn't invest it. It's not right. entrepreneurial with the gifts that they've been and given. And there's that other wonderful passage too, where, you know, to everyone to whom much has been given, much will be expected. Yes. There's that question. But then there's also the, the one who has much. The harvest is great and the labors are few is another one. That's right. And, and then, to everyone who has, more will be given to him. And from the one who has little, even what he has has will be taken away. The same idea yes. that we have to... We have to be grateful for what God has given us because nothing comes from us. It's all from mm -hmm. him. And we want to multiply that for his glory. Abundance. Super abundance. Fully alive. Like I, I, right. I, and so I've I just, come that they might have life and have it to the full, have it more abundantly. Gospel of St. John. I think perhaps we're a little bit scarred or maybe I have been in the past about when you contemplate evil. Mm. And you look at the horror, horror, horror evils that have happened in human mm. history and in our world today, and it's hard to get in the the zone of great abundance and mm -hmm. you know use your talents to build and help create beautiful things for the kingdom of God and on love people and all of this. When you then all of a sudden have the contemplation of Maximilian Kolbe, mm -hmm. you know, stripped naked and starving to death in a in, that in a bunker. bunker underground. Yes, and you you think w w that could happen? I mean, there's obviously like that you know. Evils could come to this day and age in that same way. Yes, and are and do and, and are and do. And right. so, how, what does it look like to like have your mind and heart set on Jesus and seeking to maximize the use of one's gifts for the sake of the kingdom, and to ask and pray for abundance, and then you get handed Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the royal road to heaven for Saint Maximilian Kolbe. It was his abundance. It was his abundance. In, in that way, God chose him as a beautiful sweet oblation for the salvation of many more people besides him. That's what the martyrs are in our church, right? Beginning with St. Stephen, right? That God sometimes invites those who love him very much 
to give up their life and it looks like a failure, right? The wisdom of the cross is foolishness in the eyes of men, right? The cross is, is a stumbling block to Jews and, and folly to Gentiles. But to us, who's believe, who, to us who believe, Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So just because it seems like a failure, if our hearts and minds are aligned with God's will and we are seeking that abundance, all things will be given to us besides. It will be part of this beautiful plan of God's uh, majesty and glory unfolding through us. So I love the martyrs. The martyrs, I, I, I yeah. love the martyrs. You think that, you, you know, we, we, we often avoid the cross, you and I both. Oh, I don't yes. know about you, but I certainly avoid the cross. We don't want it. We know that we must pick it up and follow the Lord. That's what he said. Take up your cross daily and follow me. But when it comes, you think, no, I can't do that. I don't want that. Think what, I wonder what it was like when St. Peter was crucified. He was thinking, boy, this is a failure. No, he was honored to follow our Lord's example. Um, any martyr, I just love to think about the martyrs because they, they are exactly what you're talking about. They're the supreme example of what you're talking about mm -hmm. in conforming oneself to Jesus Christ. And then it seems like a failure in human terms. So to make it concrete today, we might look around and say, our, our country is a mess. How many babies do we abort every year? How many, how many children are being disfigured because of this sick, diabolical transgender movement, you know, mutilating little children and adults? Like this, the, the horrors of postmodernity are every bit as bad as the horrors of the 20th century. And yet we can... Uh, conform our wills to God. We can make Jesus known and loved or help to, and God can transform all of that. God works mm -hmm. all things for the good for those who love him. Amen. It's the, it's the hope that we have. And perhaps the secret is if we are willing to ask for the abundance and live in faith and hope and trust in the abundance, that same faith and hope and trust that gave us the vision for the abundance and the grace to reinvest the abundance back for the kingdom of God again is the same faith and hope and grace that will help us if the trial were to come. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And and that's it the will secret see us of our through. faith. It will see us through. Meaning it's not, I think some people maybe are in a way, they don't even realize it, afraid of abundance mm. because it requires a tremendous amount of trust mm -hmm. to have the responsibility of big talents, big gifts, big impact. You know, all of these things it's require, a risk. it's risk. It's just like, but we know it's that, risk. don't we, Lila? Yeah. We know that in our relationships. Mm -hmm. You... Uh, you weren't able to love your husband until you were willing to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and give yourself completely to him in a way that's very risky mm -hmm. in a relationship, right? And what has come of that? Not only, I hope, mm -hmm. a beautiful married a life, beautiful but also married the, the fruit of children. beautiful kids you could ever dream of. I right? mean, yeah. I mean, I, we're just like, both of us are in marvel at the abundance of it all. Right. But that yeah. required the risk of a vulnerability, which is that daring, audacious, uh, This we're speaking natural terms. That's right. a natural relationship. Right blessed by a sacrament, but that the, the risk reward, uh, paradox there is we see it all around us. If we could just then supernaturalize that or take that, take that natural analog and cat, let it catapult mm -hmm. us into the spiritual life, being vulnerable with the Lord, being vulnerable in our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ in this desire for abundance, daring, um, uh, audacity, uh, that's the same word, that's redundant, but it's a risk. Yeah, he might call us to martyrdom. But that that he'll but he'll be with us in that. Absolutely. And that's where you have these stories of the martyrs going to their death singing. Yes, that's right. And it's just an incredible The beautiful sisters of Compiègne, the, yes. the Carmelite sisters who went to the guillotine in the French Revolution. My brother singing. and I were just talking about on the show because he they were singing lauds. That's right. Or what they were singing, the Liturgy of the Hours. Sing, I think they're singing the Te Deo, maybe. They're singing oh, the no. Liturgy of the Hours, okay. for sure. They're singing the Liturgy of the Hours. Or maybe, maybe the Salve Regina. I don't remember. There's a As wonderful... They were, and the, but the, just for folks who might not know, their their heads were being removed. They yeah. were being beheaded. Yes. But they would finish, the next woman would continue Take the song up the strain. until Take up the strain. she was beheaded. Amazing. That's a movie someone has to make. Well, there's a beautiful opera. 
Really? Yeah, the dialogue of the Carmelites. Yes, oh, you should watch it. There's, it's, it's that movie's been made, sort of. Oh, yeah. Right. I will definitely check. Look that it out. up. Dialogue of the Carmelites, and it's in in many languages, precisely because it's such an important okay, story. Okay, so Father, before we close here, I need to get your take on UFOs. All <laughs> okay. right. So I want to just watch a video. We're going to show this on the podcast. Okay. And I want to hear your take on whether or not this is of natural or human origin. So it says angels or aliens, or natural or supernatural origin, excuse me. Okay, here we go. Watch the Pentagon's three declassified USO, UFO videos. Wow, fast. <laughs> it's great. Have you seen this? I, I think I've okay. seen this one, yeah. Okay. So the Navy pilot's flying, and then there's this object that is inexplicable. Apparently, like the way that it's hovering at an extremely fast speed turns quickly. Yeah, yeah. it does things that like they no human aircraft that they know could ever do something like this, but it's not like an animal. Of course they do. So when you saw that video for the yes. first time, did you think angels? No, I didn't. No. Oh, you didn't. I didn't think angels. No, I. What do you think? Aliens? Well, it could. Be, I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're totally putting, putting me on the spot and I kind of I love know, it. I, to, I sort of love fun. it. <laughs> it's great. It is fun. Okay. So you think there could be some material explanation that we just don't understand. True. It could be some trick of the eye that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. It could be an alien. It could be something that is supernatural. That is, could be diabolical or angelic. There are all of these possibilities. And I just reserve judgment when I see something like that. How can I possibly know what is the true explanation or description of what I'm seeing in that video. Do you think, though, there are angels or demons that might hang out and make some sort of appearance around a Navy pilot flying their... They can do that. Their jet. They can do that, certainly. I mean, the angels have the power, and the demons do too, to affect those kind of visu visual... Um, I don't want to say tricks because mm -hmm. they could even, that could even be a real object and the angels and the demons mm. could make that happen. Wow. Yeah. But it also might be an alien. But it also might be an alien. And what, so then you have to say, well, what are aliens? Are, an, <laughs> what are, are aliens, aliens angels or demons? Mm. So that might be a question for our friends over at Catholic Answers. That might be a fun podcast episode. <laughs> that could be a, we might I'd have do to do that. a lot of research, actually. We might do that. Father, Father Ambrose, where can folks find the prayer, the novena before yes. Michael must and share more about how people can find more of the work of the Abbey. Okay, so uh, the Abbey has a lot of social media presence on Instagram, St. Michael's Abbey on Instagram. It's a great follow. I love your Instagram. It's so great. St. Michael's you. Abbey on Instagram. We'll, we'll uh, post the link in great. the description. Great. YouTube is growing pretty quickly as well. I think we're still probably on Facebook. Um, we have a Twitter account or X, but it's pretty small because we don't lean into it. So the, all the usual social media places, we have a virtual monastic experience called the Abbot Circle. And that's where we are going to host the novena for, for St. Michael, the Michaelmas novena at the end of September. And we'll have that posted on all the social media too, as that's coming out. But folks can follow that. I'm sure in a link to this video as well. And uh, just keep Keep an eye on what's happening at the Abbey. We're going to have also a series on politics. Uh, Excellent. Five things every Catholic should know. Politics edition. So maybe we can talk more about that at yes, some point ahead of the good. election. And um, yeah, just keep an eye on what's happening at well, the Well, you're a regular, well-loved on the show. So we look forward to having you back again soon. And it's my honor. Thank you for taking the time, Father Ambrose. God bless you and God bless everybody watching and listening. Thank you. Amen. Do you want to say a prayer for our audience to close us Let's out? Let's do it. Yep. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. Thank you for all of the ways that you bless us with gifts of nature and of grace, especially with the gospel of salvation in the incarnation of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit that is his spirit who helps to inspire us and direct us to all that is good and all that is true. So I ask that all of us here and all of us who are watching and listening will have an abundant outpouring of that same Holy Spirit so that we too can be instruments in your almighty hands through the, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through the power and intercession of all of the angels who surround us and pray for us and pray to God on our behalf. And I ask Almighty God to bless all of these good people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Thanks, Lila. That was great. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.